Well, what I've done this morning, because I wasn't quite sure of the timing, I have written out some pieces of proper prose with gaps in between them where I shall add lib a little bit. And so <clears throat> in seven or eight of these um, written paragraphs, I hope to introduce some aspects of a view of creation that is based in biblical texts, particularly in the Hebrew Bible, but in some cases where the Hebrew Bible is rather obscure, looking for additional light from the other ancient versions, notably what we call the Septuagint. So, first paragraph. The Bible has a beautiful and sophisticated account of the creation and the role of human beings. But this is not set out in a single text. Both in the biblical stories of creation and in the design of the Jerusalem temple, which is very important, there is a single vision of the relationship between time and eternity, between God and creation, and between the visible world and the invisible world of God and the angels. To understand what the Bible says about the creation, we too must glimpse the vision that informed the worship of the temple, the poetry of the Hebrew prophets, the sayings of the sages, and the images of the storytellers. All express and honour the same truth about the creation. And since the New Testament shares this view of the creation, it is the basis of any Bible-based belief about the environment. So here briefly are some points uh, about this biblical picture. First of all, the temple in Jerusalem represented the creation. The Genesis story of the six days of creation also described the ceremonial building of the temple which was in two parts, as you know, divided by the Great Curtain. The outer part represented the visible material world, the Garden of Eden as it comes through <coughs> in the stories, and the inner part, beyond the veil, <coughs> was the Holy of Holies, and this represented the invisible world of the glory of God and the angels. Now, <coughs> this picture, <coughs> excuse me, already, um, this picture of the <coughs> temple as representing the creation is fundamental to understanding how liturgy relates to the creation and how the choreography of liturgy in fact is based in um, the movements in the temple. It's now a story that's often told about me but it's also true. Uh, the first time I ever witnessed an orthodox liturgy, I realised exactly where it had come from, even though I had never seen it before. And that was quite an interesting thing, because the, um, the bishop who was there was very kind and said to me afterwards, this was all seemed very strange to you, because I had gone as a Methodist, and I said, no, on the contrary, I know exactly what it's all about. And this caused him to be a little surprised. Anyway, the temple in Jerusalem represented the creation and the Genesis story of the six days of creation also described the ceremonial building of the temple which was in two parts divided by the great curtain. Now, this pattern is ancient. You can see this if you want to work it out for yourself. Take the six days in Genesis 1 and then the account of erecting the tabernacle, which is the last column of the book of Exodus, so Exodus 40, from 17, verse 17 onwards. And if you take as your dividers the little thing, you know, as the Lord commanded Moses, Moses put this in the tabernacle, as the Lord commanded Moses. And if you take those as dividers of the six stages, you will find that the six days of creation correspond, and I can't say exactly because the text has got a bit, the Hebrew text and the Greek text at this point diverge, but certainly for the first four days and in Jewish tradition, as it was remembered in Mizrash, the 
assembling of the tabernacle, which of course is the blueprint for the temple, corresponds to the days of creation. And you can see this, the veil of the temple represents the rachiach, the division between heaven and earth. And then you have the table of the cereal offerings or the plant offerings that represents the, the third day of creation. You have the lights on the fourth day, the created lights on the fourth day and so on. So this pattern is very ancient indeed. And this shows that the whole of the temple liturgy, and that's not an exaggeration, the whole of the temple liturgy was concerned with upholding the creation. And you had to do things at the right time. If the calendar was wrong, you weren't inserting your prayers at the right time and so on. This is why they got so uh, heated over the, over the calendar and so forth. So the entire temple cult was the upholding of the creation. Now, this great veil of the temple uh, represented matter that concealed the glory of God from human eyes. Corresponds, I say, to the firmament, uh, the stereoma, as it is called in, in the Greek, separating what is above from what is below. And this means that the Holy of Holies, which is the heart of the temple, shows that God is at the heart of creation. Now, European art is very fond of showing the divine somewhere up through the sky, especially Ascension Day. We have to cope with these terrible pictures of feet going up through a hole, don't we? And things like that. I speak as a Methodist preacher and I have to deal with these problems Sunday by Sunday. Um, and this hole in the sky business is really quite a problem. But the Holy of Holies at the heart of the temple. God is at the heart of the creation. And everything that involves entering the Holy of Holies and coming out again, all temple worship concerns the relationship of the creation to God. So we have praise, we have thanksgiving, we have asking for forgiveness, we have the rituals of healing, all these things. And the whole of the visible world is seen as a temple where the human beings were the priests. Now, this is quite a difficult concept for hierarchical churches, churches like mine, it isn't a problem. But the idea that all human beings, in some sense, are priests of creation, very, very important, in fact, more than priests, high priests. And Adam, and the name, of course, Adam simply means the human, was put into Eden to, and then the famous verses in Ex, um, Genesis chapter 2, Adam is put into the garden, and he's put into the garden, uh, why do we need all these bits of preface to a Bible? Um, Genesis 2.15, the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden, to till it and to keep it. And we have all those lovely pictures, certainly in European art, of when Adam leaves Eden, he's carrying his spade and, and Eve is carrying her distaff and spindle and they're going to carry on with the work. Now, the words in the Hebrew are not actually exclusively to till and to keep, it's actually to serve it. So he's put in the garden to serve and preserve, that's what it means literally, and these are two Hebrew words which also mean to worship in the temple, like we talk about serving a liturgy, worship in the temple and preserving <coughs> the teachings. And so the role of Adam, the role of the human being, is to lead the worship of creation and to preserve the teachings about it. Adam is remembered as the first high priest of creation, not as the steward. Now, I have heard so many talks and sermons all Adam, the steward of creation, which has a kind of business relationship about it, very Protestant. Um, I can say that, being the daughter of the Reformation. Um, very Protestant. That is not the biblical image at all. This is something that is emphasized much, much later 
in the time of Jesus, and this is where I take the still of the film from, you know, where is it that Christianity takes it, has its roots. Um, Adam is the great high priest, and there was an ancient covenant with Adam, which we know in other Jewish sources, uh, which is only briefly mentioned, it's just in passing, in Hosea chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. And because it is such a strange concept to Protestant biblical scholars who are not averse to changing the text to make it mean what they know it should have meant, we find here that Adam's covenant is written out. Now, Hosea chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offering. So this is the prophet saying we want love and the knowledge of God rather than all these bloody cult sacrifices in the temple. And knowledge of God you have to think of not as knowing God, but knowing as God knows, seeing from a different perspective. And then verse 7, but like Adam, they transgressed the covenant, they dealt faithlessly with me. Implication being, and we can corroborate this from other sources, that the covenant made with Adam was one of steadfast love and seeing the creation as God sees it. Now this word, which my, this is an RSV translation, um, this word is fundamental. It's the premise of biblical environment theology. And this is the word chesed in Hebrew. Those of you who have some Hebrew will know that it's translated all sorts of ways. Um, here, loving kindness or steadfast love or something like that. And this covenant, the original covenant with Adam, is based, the premise is chesed, the loving kindness, and seeing the creation, if you like, with the eyes of God, seeing it from a different perspective. It's often said if you want to change what you see, you have to change how you see it. So after six days, God rests on the seventh, according to Genesis, the Sabbath, showing that when the creation was complete and very good, nothing more was made. And this is where we start becoming a bit countercultural, certainly our present culture, because the goal of creation is not more and more. You see, if our economy in this country flatlines, oh, goodness me, what happens? You know, we must keep on making and consuming and destroying more just to keep in business. So at this point, we're countercultural. And in fact, from this point forward, we are countercultural, but never mind. Um, so the goal of the creation is not more and more, but sufficiency, completion and rest. And it's interesting that images from the sixth day of creation, remember we're talking about Friday, and we're particularly talking about Friday afternoon. Images from the sixth day were linked to Good Friday. And so you have, it is completed. And then the rest and the new beginning. And then, of course, the first day becomes the eighth day. And that's history. So, goodness, I had to go a bit faster. I went on to point two. Um, so the whole creation, earth and heaven was bound in a network of bonds known as the Eternal Covenant or the Covenant of Peace. Now, due to the dominance of Protestant biblical scholarship in the, de in the development of what now is called biblical scholarship, I was going to say passes for it, but that would be naughty, um, <laughs> what, the, the current study of the Bible, um, the great emphasis is on the Moses Covenant. The Moses covenant, as if this was the only one, and, and everything pivots around Moses with his thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Very few of them notice that most of the revelation on Sinai is actually about how to build a place of worship, which is quite interesting. That is completely overlooked in the interest of the thou shalt not stuff. Now, people think of the covenant as some sort of deal, to quote Mr. Trump. But it's not. It's not a deal. The original idea, I know you can't base things on etymology, but all the same, we did because they did. Um, creation is to do with binding together. Joining together, binding together. And so the bonds of the covenant are what hold something together. Now, long before Moses is on the scene, the first reference we have to this 
eternal covenant, which is also called the covenant of peace, in the Noah story. And there, this is <coughs> after the disaster, we have the sign of the rainbow, and Noah has this lovely story, this promise. Come on, Genesis chapter 9, where are you? Um, has this uh, rainbow as the sign of the covenant, and it's the everlasting covenant between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. Uh, when I see the bow in the clouds, I will look upon it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature. This everlasting covenant, it's um, the middle of Isaiah, you get the same reference to the Noah story. And there it's called the uh, covenant of peace. So we know it, those two were the same thing. <coughs> and eternal means not only that it goes on forever or that it's outside time or something like that it also implies that it binds the visible creation to the invisible creation because in Hebrew there's, there's wordplay all through this all through the Hebrew Bible there is wordplay there's no one meaning for a lot of it and the hidden place of the Holy of Holies beyond matter so the place that represents the uncreated light that is also the eternal place it's the same word it's the root holam and so the eternal covenant is the system of bonds that binds this visible world to the hidden but constant presence of god so when we get ourselves liberated and say we have no need of this god hypothesis what we do is cut ourselves off from that which, according to the Bible, holds all things together. And I have illustrated this many times with um, a sermon. Uh, if you stand in a traditional church and you face your congregation when preaching, you have the, pla the place that represents the light behind you. You have to explain this first. If you have the light behind you, you turn your back on... Uh, the presence of God in creation and what you see is the whole of the visible creation in a human shadow that's a very powerful image you can only preach that sermon once because they remember it mm -hmm. okay um, but this idea that you can only see what holds creation together if you're looking in the right direction is extremely important if you're looking at the bottom line of the account sheet you're not going to see it now, peace here, the covenant of peace, that's the usual translation of the Hebrew word shalom. But shalom means far more than just peace. It means wholeness, it means integrity, everything as God intended it to be. And the covenant of peace, and you have to imagine it as this kind of multidimensional spider's web, um, holds all things together. And it's interesting that in the... Um, community rule from Qumran which we know was used in the time of Jesus uh, this covenant is actually called the covenant of Chesed and I suspect that this is the covenant in fact I know that this is the covenant that Jesus was renewing at the last supper because nothing else makes sense of the other early Christian imagery but we shan't have time to deal with uh, everything in detail today so everything that's the visible natural world human society and the invisible world of the angels, these are all part of one system. And the Benedicity, I don't know how many people still sing this, I remember this at school, and even at that early age I noticed that you didn't get to the visible world until you were halfway through, which is quite interesting, because in our school, Salters, it was the top of the second page. So the Benedicity lists the invisible world before the visible, and shows and reminds us of the importance of the invisible creation and they are all called to praise the creation now the bonds of the covenant hold everything together and join the visible world to God at the centre and they imagined that these bonds were sealed and held together by the name now in the prayer of Manasseh you have shackled the sea and the bonds sealed by the name and also find this in other by those who bore the name 
Now, the sign of the name of the Lord in the temple, in the first temple, was a diagonal cross, like that. And it was only when Christianity was losing its connection with its conscious connection with the temple that this was rotated 45 degrees and became one of those and the original mark of baptism was the diagonal cross you were marked on the forehead as was the high priest you were marked with the name of the Lord and so you yourself bore the sign that you were a seal of the bonds of creation that in itself is a sobering thought now, any action which broke any bond of the creation, any of the creation covenant, by definition was a sin. So you can't have church committees, as we do, redefining sin. Human conduct could and did destroy the system. And the sin which was so destructive could be deliberate or through ignorance but the sin and the effect was the same and this is why the two duties of the high priest in the temple one was to teach correctly and the other was to perform the great rite of atonement which was not a rite of propitiation that's another protestant deviation it is the rite of healing healing of creation and those who are the high priests of creation have that duty put upon them so one of the key roles of the priests and the angels and of course the Christians in when we took over temple uh, paradigms we have become the angels we're kind of the lowest rank and the uh, apprentices very much so but we are the holy ones we're the saints um, one of the key roles of the priests and the angels is to teach about right conduct breaking away from God what European culture has called enlightenment a strange choice of term wasn't it breaking away from God was not liberation but deprivation losing touch with the source of life and renewal now the mystics at Qumran and some of their texts are really very difficult to translate you can translate in the, the individual words and you can put them down and say ah yes I wonder what that says really very very difficult but the mystics of Qumran um, one of their phrases was <coughs> the mystery of existence the Raz Nihye or it could be translated the mystery of becoming and part of their uh, spiritual practice however you want to call it was gazing into uh, the source of life and just wondering at it you see the paths of everything that exists I would love to know what those people were doing. I have wrestled with those, <laughs> wrestled with those texts, and I use the word wrestled. Um, and I'm not a lot further forward than I was many years ago. Um, but I think one of the things about knowledge is knowing what you don't know. Um, now, when the bonds of this covenant had been broken by human sin to a huge extent, the whole system collapsed now an illustration that's nice to use this is something we used to do when we were children in the autumn when we were walking to school I lived in the country we used to look for spiders webs and we used to poke to see how many strands you could break and the web still stayed and then finally it was gone and it was you had to be very careful to break as many as you could before it finally disappeared this is the image now you won't you can't go to a concordance and look up spider's web and find this in the bible but that's just a picture i'm drawing for you this is how they imagined the the great covenant um it could keep things running and going with a limited amount of sin but when everyone decides to break it it is no longer there and this is the problem when the bonds of the covenant are broken the system collapses and this is why we have associated with the um, collapse of the covenant we have these visions that are called apocalyptic visions that's not a good way to use the word apocalyptic but it's a common misuse of it and so we use it and so you have pictures of the stars falling from the sky and, and 
all that kind of stuff. Um, but I want to read you, first of all, I'll read you the Jeremiah. Jeremiah is actually obviously later than Isaiah, but um, this is Jeremiah chapter 4, reading uh, 4 verses 22, and well, starting at verse 22. My people are foolish, they know me not. Now that's reference to having the knowledge of God, seeing things as God sees. A lot of this is to do with education, knowledge, and how you use knowledge. So, my people are foolish, they know me not, they are stupid children, they have no understanding, they are skilled in doing evil, but how to do good they know not. Then, Jeremiah gives us his reverse picture of Genesis. He says, I looked on the earth, and lo, it was waste and void. Tohu vavohu. Those are the exact words you get at the beginning of Genesis. How everything was before the Creator started sorting it out. Right? I looked on the earth, lo, it was waste and void to the heavens, and they had no light. So that's Genesis 1, before Genesis 1. I looked on the mountains, and lo, they were quaking, and the hills moved to and fro. I looked, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the air had fled. I always remember Rachel Carson's book, The Silent Spring. Do you remember that? When she said there was no bird song, and they'd done it to themselves. It wasn't witchcraft. They'd done it to themselves. Um, the birds of the air had fled. I looked. The fruitful land was a desert. Its cities were laid in ruins before the anger of the Lord. Now, the word wrath isn't the one that's used here, but the idea of wrath, and I'll come back to this a time later, is not God sitting on his throne and saying, I don't like you, zap, zap, zap. Um, wrath is the natural consequence of breaking a bond of the covenant. Philip Pullman did this very well in his um, Dark Matter trilogy. Um, and I can't remember exactly the names he used for it, but certain creatures could get in when certain protective skins were broken. These nasty things could get in and turn everything to dust. Well, this is very much like the picture of the wrath. Um, if you deliberately break down that which protects you from chaos and disaster, then what you are enjoying is, if you like, the consequence of what you have chosen to do. Now, Isaiah chapter 24, this one is very controversial nobody can date it as if it matters it is 24 it is of timeless importance now the form of this is Isaiah 24 starting at verse 4 here Isaiah is giving us um, a Hebrew lament kind of three lines in parallel and, and the meter and all the rest of it this is a lament the earth mourns and withers the world languishes and withers. The heavens languish together with the earth. So it's all, all collapsing. Mm -hmm. The earth lies polluted under its inhabitants. That's an interesting translation, isn't it? It's actually, the word is elsewhere is translated as godless. Um, the world is polluted under its inhabitants for, and there's another triple here, they've transgressed the laws, violated the statutes, broken the everlasting covenant, therefore... A curse devours the earth, its inhabitants suffer for their guilt, the inhabitants of the earth are scorched, and few men are left. That is spine chilling. And we've had that in the scriptures for, well, who's going to date Isaiah, but a very, very long time indeed, and no one seems to have taken any notice. So, Jeremiah and Isaiah describe this situation, foolish children breaking the covenant, and always there is this element of knowledge being abused. This is hugely, hugely important. The role of knowledge and the responsible use of knowledge. Because knowledge is power. A story I often tell, again, from the pulpit, illustrating this. If somebody... 20 years ago indeed now had given me a box of bits and said I'll give you a large sum of money if you'll make a bomb for me I would, wouldn't be a relevant question I couldn't do it if someone had given it to my son who read engineering in this university he could have done it but he wouldn't and how you use your knowledge the stewardship of knowledge is so so important and in a knowledge based economy what we have lost is the Bible picture of anointed knowledge, which is what is called wisdom. 
Now, when the eternal covenant, the everlasting covenant, has been broken, it is repaired by the ritual of atonement. Atonement, certainly in the Protestant tradition, has become associated with the ideas of penal substitution and appeasing an angry God and, and all these things. That is no, has no biblical basis. No biblical basis whatsoever, and uh, I'm happy to debate that with any person who likes, from my tradition, who would like to um, try to establish that from the Bible. That has no biblical basis. Atonement is the ritual whereby, I'm thinking of the great day of atonement described in Leviticus 16, but that is such an old text. Um, it's been fragmented, it's been all sorts of things. Like so it is not easy to disentangle. Um, the whole temple is purified from the effects of sin. Now, what happens on the Day of Atonement is that you have a ritual involving two goats. And there is a famous mistranslation, and we know from Origen that the Christians did not understand it in this way, or certainly Origen didn't understand it in this way, and he was about the best early biblical scholar that we have. Uh, Leviticus 16, uh, two goats, verse 8, Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for Azazel. Two goats, one for the Lord and one for Azazel. That reads as though these goats are a sacrifice to the Lord and to Azazel. Question one, who is offering a sacrifice to the prince of demons? It, Origen understood that Hebrew preposition, the L, the L, not to mean for, but its other meaning as. So these two goats <coughs> represented the Lord and Azazel. The ritual then takes on its original temple meaning. The goat that represents the Lord is sacrificed, and the blood, which is the life, in Hebrew ritual, blood is life, not death, the life that represents the life of the Lord is taken into the Holy of Holies, offered on the throne, various sprinklings are done, and then, as the high priest comes out, he sprinkles and smears that blood, various places, to purify, reconsecrate, and heal. Um, he shall sprinkle blood upon the altar, this is just verse 19, to cleanse it and hallow it from the uncleannesses of the people of Israel. So, the atonement ritual, if you like, is a divine blood transfusion to repair the creation. And then when the high priest gets outside the temple, he becomes a sin bearer in a very, very dangerous role. And that's the origin. I'm deviating a little. I'm watching my watch. Um, that's the original meaning of you will not wear the, take the name of the Lord your God in vain because the Hebrew word take also means wear. If you wear the name of the Lord your God lightly, you will not be held guiltless. You will not be protected from the sin that you carry. So the high priest carries a sin, he becomes a sin bearer, and then with two hands, which is interesting, he uses two hands, he transfers that sin to Azazel, the source of the sin, and drives him off. And that's what that ritual was all about. And so you have the, the Day of Atonement as the Lord giving his life to heal and renew and restore the creation. And I lead a Good Friday service every year. And it is much, much easier, I use that simple word, to do a Good Friday service based on temple theology. When I first started doing this, I had people smiling and crying as they came out of church. And that was wonderful. So, it's, eternal covenant is repaired by atonement. But this wasn't a magical act. Um, everyone who wished to be involved in this atonement had to repent and do whatever he or she could to renew and restore what they had damaged in the previous year, since the previous Day of Atonement. Because once you had done your best to put right your own mess and your own damage, 
then you could come and be included in the great ritual of renewal and of course that was the preface uh, every 50 years to the great jubilee and so forth now Paul takes this up he uses this a lot um, and I suggest Romans 12 is one example where he talks about he, he writes to the community in Rome and he says you are called to be this sacrifice now because blood is the life the ritual at the end of, of the day of atonement was pouring out the blood in other words pouring out the life that's how you uh, completed it the blood flowed down under the great altar outside the temple uh, the day of atonement was the only time blood was taken into the temple under the, which is why you have this vision in the book of Revelation of the blood of the martyrs under the altar because they were part of the great atonement All right, um, but the biblical books don't give you all the bits in between you have to join the dots yourself um, and Paul says Romans 12 1 I appeal to you therefore brethren by the mercies of God present your bodies as a living sacrifice so you pour out your life not in death but in the way that you live although some are called to die which is your spiritual worship <clears throat> and then this is the knowledge thing do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind you think differently so watching the clock go back now to the holy of holies which is the invisible eternal presence and this is a unity it was a represented unity because God is one this is a unity that underlines underlies and binds together in one system everything in the visible creation now this is signalled right at the beginning of the book of Genesis there's a whole lot of rabbinic commentary on this if you read the, the Midrash Rabbah on Genesis and things like that which is it's all available in English um, it's fascinating how they debated the meaning of day one because the Hebrew actually says um, for Genesis 1-5 um, there was evening there was morning day one it doesn't say the first day so many English translations have the first day the Hebrew and the Greek they have this thing that jars uh, evening and morning day one why was it because this is the how they debated it day one was separate it wasn't the first it wasn't something that was historically prior to the second third fourth fifth and sixth it wasn't part of a sequence it was day one that underlies all the others and so second third fourth that's fine they were in a sequence but you did not think of the moment of creating light and the moment of the origin of all things it was not something in the distant past it was the it is the invisible present that binds now the holy one with the creation now the prophets glimpsed this in their visions and this is the great basis of the prophetic visions the prophets glimpse this and the sages warned that when people lost sight of it everything disintegrated and this is the uh, famous Hebrew Bibles go the other way <laughs> it's quite embarrassing um, Proverbs 29 Proverbs 29 uh, verse 18 this English is where there is no prophecy the people cast off restraint literally where there is no vision the people unravel and that's lovely because that's this is a simple proverb if you keep your vision of the unity that underlies all things you're looking in the right direction and you've got something that holds it together now the people on earth were able to learn something about God and the creation from the angels angels as you know just means a messenger but these angels are themselves a part of the glory and the unity because the light and the unity cannot be divided and if you think about how discoveries are made and so forth um, discoveries are made by joining things together 
Um, this is one of the awful things <coughs> that comes from people trying to patent knowledge and this kind of thing. It's not theirs. So they've discovered it. It was already there. And this is one of the big issues. You know, can you patent life processes? Can you? This is a big ethical issue for all sorts of things. Um, but the inspiration enables you to make connections and to discover. Now, um, the angels famously sing. And the song of the angels in temple tradition symbolizes the harmony of all creation centered on God. And when people on earth praise the creator, <coughs> the benedicity, and all the creation, they join with the angels in their music and they become part of the great passive creation. Now, this is why that brief notice we have of the angels at Bethlehem, they see the glory, <coughs> Glory to God in the highest, that's the praise bit, and you know what follows. That sums up creation theology. And the story was that <coughs> when Adam and Eve sinned and they left the garden, they lost sight of the glory and they no longer heard the sound of the angels. Hush the noise, you men of strife, and hear the angels sing. I'm sure you sing that as well as we, we do. So the harmony and the shalom uh, of creation are maintained by the obedience of the angels and there's a whole collection of myth about um, and parabiblical stories about the fallen angels who initially were the priests of the second temple who decided to change things which is quite interesting and what they did the fallen angels they revealed knowledge of the creation but they did not accept what the tradition calls the law of the great holy one so they were liberated and then the myth describes all the dreadful things that happened so we have the fallen angels and the fallen angels are the ones that get put in well the leader of the fallen angels gets put in that big pit in revelation and chained up and so forth but the book of revelation is a way into all this um, very briefly um, the holy of holies uh, <clears throat> with its light and so forth is the blueprint for the idea of the kingdom of God and the in the Holy of Holies in the first temple but not in the second the Holy of Holies was empty in the second in the first temple there is this great throne formed by the two golden cherubs and so forth and this was the focus of the rule of God and so the Holy of Holies, with its light and its eternity and its being beyond the material world and its unity and so forth, this is the inspiration of the idea of the kingdom of God. And the parables that we read in the New Testament are people becoming aware of this. You know, Jesus in Luke, Luke 17, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Now there's big volumes written about Greek prepositions and things like that. It actually is a reference to the Holy of Holies. The Kingdom of God is in your midst. The awareness of the Kingdom of God grows like the seed. When you find it, it's a great treasure. Lots of wordplay underlie the parables here. and I, I'll just tell you one. Um, <clears throat> when Isaiah saw and recorded and charted Israel going astray he called the people who remained faithful the remnant and the remnant the faithful people in Hebrew is the same word as yeast do you recall a parable about someone who hid and waited for it to work there you go um, and the lady, well we could have another day on that, but the lady of course is the Lady Wisdom and again totally neglected in so many parts of the church, but there we are. Now, how, can you, how do you illustrate this? In, in John's Gospel, um, we know this was the choreography, if you like, of John's Gospel because uh, John 17, this is the great high priestly prayer after the Last Supper. Verse 5. Father, glorify me in thy own presence with the glory which I had with thee before the world was made. 
that is the other bookend, if you like, because you know the light comes into the world in the prologue of the gospel, and then towards the end, Jesus says he's going back. And the glory which he shares before the creation of the world is temple talk for the holy of holies, that state of unity, the, the uncreated light, which underlies all the visible creation that we see represented by the rest of the temple. And so <clears throat> for Ascension Day, which is coming up, we should be thinking more in terms of the high priest going through the veil, which in fact is what Luke describes, because the veil and the clouds, and he blesses them. Now the high priest did his blessing and went in sort of in a cloud of incense. The high priest has gone into the Holy of Holies, Acts chapter 3, waiting for him to come out again. That's, what that, that's the origin of the second coming, but again, that's another day. Now, uh, point number four. Dear, dear, oh dear. Um, so the pattern of creation is determined by God. It's described as the statutes, the engraved things. That's the <coughs> literal thing. When earth is in harmony with the divine statutes, the natural world, human society enjoy justice and righteousness. These are words that describe the final state of peace. Now, if you want to establish peace, there are four stages. I could spend a day on this. Um, the four processes are, first of all, the premise is chesed, that word loving kindness. And this was the covenant of chesed. Chesed opens your eyes. This is the premise. And this enables you to make a right judgment about the situation. That's the word mishpat. Mishpat leads to the right action. And right action means action to put things right. And this is the word sedek zedaka. And it gives us the word righteous. Now, righteous in English has a, a bit of a nasty kind of tinge about it. You know, people who are self-righteous. But in fact, a righteous person if we're thinking Hebraically, puts things right. And it's the same root as gives us the name Zadok for the high priest. Zadok, in all likelihood, was not his name. It was his job description. He was the one, I see a nodding head, excellent. And then, and then when you have had your Zadok doing his business of putting things right, the result is shalom. So you have... Loving kindness, that's the premise. Loving kindness, right judgment, right action, healing, and then shalom. Now this transfers to the New Testament, all Paul's complicated arguments about justification by faith and righteousness, which are the most abused words in preaching, believe me, um, actually refer to this process of seeing things and healing, putting things right. Ours not to judge. I used to use an illustration from a dreadful pitted road near one of our local churches, which drove along like this, and suddenly my illustration was useless because they mended it. But I used to be able to say, when you drive along that road, there are two processes. One is to smooth it out so people can use it to heal it. The other one is to go after the building contractor whose overweight lorries made those holes. That's the judgment. That's not ours to do. Our job is to fill in the holes. Now, I'll tell you a little bit briefly um, the exact measurements and proportions and roles of everything are planned by God. These are known as the mysteries of creation. These are not simply cosmic dimensions, but they also include fair dealing in weights and measures. You get this set out very clearly in Ezekiel <coughs> chapter 43 and 45. Um, you have this picture that just commerce, justice in commerce, is an important part of a just, just, just creation. And when Ezekiel has his cherub who has become corrupt, falling from heaven, his sin is that he used his wisdom, he abused his wisdom for the pursuit of, let me read it, it's a lovely bit, for the pursuit of trade. This is Ezekiel 28, I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God. Um, 
This is the cherub who had been the signet of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty, in Eden, the garden of God. Verse 17, your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of splendor, and I cast you to the ground. I just want to preach on. Now, um, progress is not part of the picture. The aim is to keep everything in harmony, and this is why we say in the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, which means... I will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, <clears throat> shall I leave the last two sections? Otherwise, we shan't have any time to talk. Um, what's a terrible question? Do you want to tell us what they are? Yeah, there, there are. There is. Yeah, there's two more pages. I'm leave it like that, and then talk about this. Otherwise, I feel I've turned the hose on you a little. Um, <laughs> worse than that it's two and a half pages so let's stop there and then we've got time to yeah I am um, given the shortness of time I, I really don't want to take any significant time for a response because in a way my paper will be a, re a response uh, talking about how this is worked out in contemporary and historic uh, Christian worship, specifically Orthodox worship. I was struck immediately the, the temple structure, the Holy of Holies, the invisible world, and the angels. This is something that St. Maximus the Confessor takes up in his mystagogy, which I'm, I'm not going to talk about in any detail, but it is that is what underlies the modern but you know, traditionally based idea of cosmic liturgy. The, you know, it, it's, it's ironic in a way that, and you know, fortuitous, that this day is taking place uh, at, at a time when not you know, specifically climate problems are very much in the news and in a way i can i can see some people you know might have looked at the poster and think you know only in oxford or cambridge would you have you know there are people out on the street saying emergency panic you know uh, we're all going to be dead in 10 years and here are people talking about you know the world as a temple not made by hands. And we were in fact uh, in church you know, Fridays during Lent celebrating pre-sanctified liturgy and the school children outside were yelling with their banners. I, I'm not quite sure who they were yelling at in the middle of Cambridge but um, they were yelling about the need to do something. And I think what this this is something very important to recognize that the way we see and perceive the whole of creation and ourselves within it is absolutely paramount to any solutions and responses that aren't purely short term. So I will shut up and we can have a good 20 minutes discussion.